Welcome back uh, to Introduction to Sociology. Today we're going to talk about social structure. So today the lecture is going to reflect a lot of the previous stuff we talked about, macro sociology, particularly functionalism. So social structure means relationships and interactions that individuals have that occur in a recurrent and stable pattern. So typically there are certain social structures, which we also call institutions, such as family, education, work, and these all encourage certain types of behavior. Macro sociology sees social structure as a social fact, that these institutions exist outside the, the individual and between individuals. So, so the individual is placed within an institution. Uh, however, the structure does change. So institutions evolve and develop over time as they adjust to different types of conditions. So education, for example, is not the same today as it was 50 years ago. First of all, here we are doing education online. Right? On the other hand, you, the nature of universities has changed. They become, uh, today universities are a lot more expensive than they were 50 years ago, when they were a lot cheaper than they were 50 years before that. So this, the system changes constantly. Now, status means your position within one of these institutions, typically speaking. But status usually is, means a position relative to somebody else. So remember what Weber said, that status uh, is uh, uh, like being better or, or below somebody else. Right? So, for example, professor versus student. Right? The professor has, the professor-student relationship doesn't mean anything outside the realm of the institution of education. But we can see it's a hierarchical relationship. Right? Some statuses may not be hierarchical. They may be more equal to each other. Like, for example, uh, co-workers in a, in a workplace, that's a status. It's a relationship, but not necessarily a hierarchical one. Think of other statuses. Rich, poor, black, white, male, female, so on and so forth. Right? So status indicates a relationship with other people sometimes a hierarchical one, sometimes an egalitarian one. Now, some of these statuses are basically given to you at birth by society. We could say society assigns you a status, right? So, for example, I was assigned the status of being male, right? So they decided I was male. Now, you'd say, well, Dr. John, didn't they notice something and that's why they call you male? Well, it isn't just the biology. Because if it were just the biology, why do they put all these expectations on me? I'm supposed to act a certain way. I'm supposed to be strong. I'm not supposed to cry. I'm supposed to grow up and get a job, right? And if I'm a woman, I would have different expectations, right? So that's what I mean by an ascribed status. The status are the expectations uh, of, that are going to be given to you. Uh, being white is another one. But, for example, I could have been born king. That would have been nice. If I had been born king, it would have anything to do with my physical status, with whether I was white or black. It would simply be my father was king, therefore I'm king. So assigned status, or rather ascribed status, doesn't mean uh, anything necessarily to do with your physical state. Although that may be the excuse they use to assign you to that status. On the other hand, achieve status means those things that you go out and earn for yourself. So being a professor, I had to earn that. I had to achieve that. Um, but sometimes it can be confusing. So what status is your gender? Now, gender is not just the same as sex. Gender has to do with your role expectations. So some people, uh, I'm heterosexual, let me say, right? Some people are homosexual. So is that a choice? Did they achieve that? We don't know entirely, but it's not entirely ascribed by society either. Society doesn't necessarily say that you're heterosexual or homosexual. 
So there's the element of individual choice there. What about your job? Typically, job is seen as a, an achieved status. But if you're born poor, it's very hard to become an entrepreneur. Some people do it, but most people don't. So your ascribed status of being poor will have a huge influence on your achieved status. Uh, social class, again, is your ascribed status of birth, typically. Although you may end up improving or uh, losing out. Religion, again, very often, modern society, we think of religion as a choice. But in fact, usually most people follow their parents' religion. So it's typically ascribed, first of all, by your parents. They tell you what religion you are. But people do change. So in that sense, you could say it's achieved. Um, your age, well, I guess I achieved my age. But again, it's not something I did. I earned it, as it were. I didn't, I didn't earn it. So you could say age is also ascribed. Uh, your race. Typically, race is ascribed, although some people may pass. They may be very light-skinned and they pass for white. Or somebody may say, I, want a, I, I have a brown skin, so even though I was born in a white family, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to pass as Hispanic or black. Um, nationality, again, this is something where typically your nationality is ascribed. Uh, you're born a citizen of a specific country based on where you're born and or your parents. But of course, this also is something you can change over your lifestyle, uh, lifetime. So ascribed status is something you can influence or change, uh, but very often it's gonna be influenced by your ascribed status. Um, did I say that right? Achieved status is something you can influence, but it's very often influenced by your ascribed status as well. So. For example, only a woman can become a mother. So this is a limitation. On the other hand, gender and race will probably affect everybody's life chances one way or the other. So because we occupy different positions in different institutions, we have a status set. In other words, we have a number of different statuses that we fill at the same time. For example, I'm a professor in the educational institution. In the family, I'm a father, a husband, man. Uh, in society as a whole, I guess I'm a man. Uh, in, say, in the economic system, I'm middle class. In the, in the club, I'm a friend. In workplace, I'm an employee. So these are all different statuses. Now, typically, uh, people will have a master status. It's how they think of yourself. Uh, but it can change, for example, Depending on when you're at home, your master status is going to be father or husband. When you go to work, as far as people around you see you, they're going to see your status as an employee. However, uh, you may think of yourself, I'm, you know, husband first. That's my first obligation. And then I'm a, I'm a worker. So we often see people's master status is where they tend to put their primary emphasis. And it may change over time. So, for example, maybe you're a professor, you retired. Now you're not a professor anymore. It changed. Now, roles are the specific expectations, rights, and duties that accompany a status. So, for example, uh, as remember, uh, Goffman talked about the dramaturgical uh, 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 process. We have to play a role as a particular status. As a teacher, if I go into a classroom and just sit there and do nothing, right? you would say, hold it, what kind of teacher is this? He's not doing anything. He's not fulfilling his expectations. So you would assume I have a duty. As a teacher, I have a duty to do certain things. Those are what you, as a student, expect of me. Also, the university expects certain things from me. Maybe the same, maybe they're different. Right? So rights also are things that I can demand of other people. So as an employee, I expect to get a salary and maybe benefits from my workplace. I expect to be treated in a certain way by my workplace. 
Um, I wouldn't expect my workplace necessarily to take care of all of my needs, though. Right? I, I, I want to take care of my own needs. I'll do my own cooking, thank you very much. I don't want my workplace providing my food and providing everything. I want to have my own independence. Right? Role performance, this is how you actually carry out a role. So obviously there are variations in how people carry out the role of being a teacher. So there's some variation of what people's expectations are, right? But some people may say, oh, Dr. Cross, he's brilliant. He's a wonderful professor. He's a wonderful teacher. Other people may say, hey, he's the worst teacher I've ever had in my life. So there may be different expectations based on people's other experiences. Um, now, roles, just like statuses, one status may have multiple roles. Remember, Goffman talked about front stage and backstage. So as a teacher, I have one role with regard to students and another role with regard to the administration and another role with regard to my fellow teachers. Right? So the students expect me to teach them and grade their papers and evaluate them. The administration expects me to be on time, to uh, make sure my paper, paperwork is clean. My fellow teachers expect me to help them uh, out when they need it or, or collaborate in certain areas. Right? So you have a role set. These are the different roles in with regard to one status. Uh, and of course, the broader role set is all the different roles you play with regard to many statuses. So as an individual, you may have a lot of statuses and a lot of roles, and this is going to make up who you are as an individual. But it's not all hunky-dory. There's going to be conflict sometimes. A role conflict is when the demands of two statuses conflict. So for example, you're a student, but you also work uh, at the McDonald's. So as a student, I, the teacher, expect you to hand in your papers on time, do your exams, uh, not tell me about all your problems. Uh, your, your manager is expect you to be there on time, to handle things responsibly at work, not to be doing homework while you're supposed to be uh, taking care of the hamburgers, and not to give them problems related to other issues, right? So. That's a time conflict, right? Sometimes you have an exam and the boss wants you to be at work uh, all week before the exams. So you don't have time to study. That's a conflict between two statuses. A role strain is when the expectations of one status or one role are incompatible. So, for example, if a friend comes up and says, do you think my hair looks good? I just spent $200 on a new hairdo. <laughs> what do I do? Do I tell her the truth? Your hair looks horrible. You just wasted $200. Or do I tell him a lie to be nice? Oh, yeah, it looks really good. <laughs> just put this hat on. <laughs> um, as, a, as an artist, maybe, I want to create art that is unique, that is aesthetically pleasing, that is beauty for the sake of beauty. On the other hand, I need to make money, so I need to sell stuff. I need to make art that people will want to buy. That's a role strain. So you might want to fill this out uh, or, or something similar to this. Um, we'll have a copy of this in the, in the companion. And the idea is simply to think about what your different statuses and roles are. Because every life is kind of complicated. So think about your achieved statuses. Right for me, okay, I'm a professor. I'm um, and uh, what else am I? I'm middle class, let's say. I am educated. I hope uh, I am uh, I, uh, a rock rock star. Oh, uh, maybe uh, a scribe. Well, I'm a man. I'm white. Uh, I'm uh, middle aged. Uh, I have uh, well, having brown hair is not really a status. Um, I am uh, American, right? So there you have four ascribed statuses. And then just pick two, and then what are the roles? What do people expect from you as, as that status? So for example, 
a scribe status. Man, okay, what is what do people expect from me? Oh, they expect me to be uh, to not be emotional. They expect me to um, to bring home the bacon. They expect me to be responsible. They expect so these are the expectations. So the roles, the role sets, and then think about what strains there are and what conflicts there are. Remember, the strain is one role. Uh, the 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 strain between or within a role pulling you in different directions, and a conflict is a conflict between different roles, usually of different statuses. So, for, uh, for example, I'm your father. A role strain would be I want to love you, but I also want to discipline you so that you, you learn. A uh, role conflict would be I'm your father, but I'm also a policeman. So I want to protect you, but if I catch you with a joint, I'm going to have to take you to jail, right? Role laxative, this means you leave a role. So, for example, a professor may retire. If you're a student, you're going to graduate, so you will leave the role. Master status, just think about what your master status is. Generally, if you're a child or living at home, that will probably be your master status. When you go to college, then student becomes your master status. If you're working, uh, delivering pizza to make ends meet, that's not going to be your master status. You will say, I'm working pizza in order to pay for my studies. So student is your master status. Now, we often notice there are particular ceremonies and rituals we use to symbolize when people move from one status to another. So these are called status ceremonies, and they mark transitions. So usually people leaving one status uh, and or entering another status. And they, usually there are symbols that symbolize this process, like, for example, marriage. Why does the bride wear white? People will say because it symbolizes purity, but one theory is that white is the color of death. So wearing white symbolizes the death of you as a girl, and now you're becoming a married partner of your husband or wife. Retirement. Why do we give a retired person a gold watch? I mean, he doesn't have to show up to work anymore. Why does he need a watch? Right? So it's a symbol of now he's got nothing but time. Maybe. Graduation rituals, right? When we graduate, we throw our hat in the air. Maybe this is a symbol of liberation. We're throwing away this symbol of a student status. Uh, it's interesting that most pre-modern societies have specific growing up rituals for women as well as for men. Um, sometimes women in some cultures still have quinceanera or uh, a sweet 16 birthday. These are kind of uh, uh, semblances of previous rituals. Uh, men usually don't have any rituals. It used to be you'd go out and kill somebody, and that would be that would be the symbol that now you're a man. You've got somebody's head on your on your shoulder. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't happen anymore. And even though there are certain ceremonies, like you get a driver's license, you go to college, uh, uh, in some cases maybe get married, but it's still hard to tell when. At what point do I exactly become? A man, an independent person, a responsible person. And the lack of these ceremonies sometimes leaves people in a kind of limbo. They don't know where they stand. Now, groups are the people around you that you relate to on a regular basis, the people you feel united to, uh, you have stable patterns of social interaction with. So groups are different from institutions. <clears throat> institutions are set up uh, and individuals are like plugged into them. Groups are made up of individuals creating the groups themselves. So very often within an institution you'll have many groups and they personalize the experience. So the group is more of something you feel a part of and you feel a relationship with, a personal relationship with. Now it's different from an aggregate. This is just a bunch of people who happen to be in the same place, 
They will interact, but only in passing. So people on the street is an aggregate. It's not a social group. They do have common norms and values in a certain sense. They don't want to crash into each other. People want to avoid appearing rude. They don't want to have a conflict or a fight. So we have a lot of norms that dictate how we, we negotiate around other people in the street. <clears throat> but you're still an aggregate. You're not, you're not interacting on a regular basis. A category is somewhat similar, except it's based on a characteristic. So for example, I'm white, that's a characteristic. So I'm in the category of white people. And, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm a member of a group based, you know, I, I have a group status or membership with all other white people. Right? On the contrary, I don't feel that that has any significance for me. But sometimes a shared characteristic can be the basis of group membership. So for example, maybe you're at the university and you're left-handed and you form a club of left-handed people because you all share some of the same problems and frustrations. Same thing with, uh, it could be, again, uh, you're disabled and you share common frustrations with other disabled people. So a category can be a basis of a group based on common interests. An aggregate can, be, uh, can become a group based on a common situation. So for example, you get on an elevator, you might just be a, an aggregate of people getting on an elevator, but if you get stuck in that elevator for 20 hours, you're going to become a group. You will know everybody in there, and you'll probably share more life stories with them than with your most intimate friends. Institutions, remember we talked about the functionist analysis society is made up of, of different institutions that perform different uh, functions. So medical care takes care of providing health care, keeps people healthy. Religion um, gives people a reason for living or prevents anomie. Uh, economics provides goods and resources. Politic politics creates a legitimacy so that we feel like we're, we're in a society where the right people are in charge, whether or not that's true. Uh, family, again, reproduction, care, socialization, love. Now, most institutions share you with other institutions. Most of the time, you're going to be in different, different institutions all at the same time. You're going to be with your family, you're going to go to work, you're going to go to school, maybe you go to church, maybe you go to a club, maybe you go visit your friends. So all of these institutions uh, are a part of you and you will have different statuses and roles in each one and that combination gives you individuality because it's different from everybody else's combination it makes you different and you can interpret it differently right? but some institutions are what we call total institutions these are institutions that want to dominate you and again, usually for a very specific reason. So for example, medical institution, if you're very sick, the medical institution takes over and you become just an object within that institution. Uh, a better example, or maybe easier to understand for you, would be prisons, right? Prisons are not gonna let you out to go home or to go to church or to do anything else. You're in prison. So it's a total institution. And typically when you have a total institution, there are status degradation rituals that are designed to integrate you, or I should say disintegrate your previous statuses and integrate you into a new status, a process which we call resocialization. Now, you might remember Harold Garfinkel of ethnomethodology fame. He was the one who brought up this idea of the degradation ritual. These are specific steps that total institutions use to take individuals and push them into a mold. So, for example, prisoners. What happens when you go to prison? You're shaved, you're stripped and searched, you're given humiliating uniforms so you're easily recognizable, you're insulted, 
you're expected to conform, you're given a number that strips you of your individuality. What happens when you join the army? You go to boot camp, you're shaved, you're stripped and examined, you're given a humble uniform so you can be seen for what you are, you're insulted, you're expected to conform, you're given a number. It's the same, because it's the same logic. They want to take you, an individual who previously had a number of different associations, and put you in a box so that you become totally dedicated to one institution. What about medical patients? You might not have agreed with me when I said medicine is a total institution, at least sometimes. Patients, what happens if you're a severe, uh, you have a severe illness? You're shaved very often. You're stripped and examined and cleaned. You're given humiliating gowns. You're objectified. The doctors all prod you and treat you like a piece of meat. You're expected to conform and obey the nurses and orderlies. You're given a chart with a number on it. It's the same thing. Why? Because when you become seriously sick, this becomes a new role. And you know, when you've been sick, what happens? You don't care about anything else. Say, like, I'm sick, my head hurts. Oh, oh, I forget about work. I forget about studies. I forget. And in fact, this is a specific role. Society, when you're sick, society gives you permission to forget your other roles and focus only on your sick role. So it's a social role, just like any other role. Think about other similar types of places, like, for example, when you join a frat, you have the tradition of hazing. This is a process by which new members are humiliated in order to allow them into the group. Uh, joining a cult, very often a cult will follow the same process, but maybe even even more extreme manner. And you could probably think of other examples. The point is, you're stripped of your previous statuses and roles that gave you uh, a sense of who you were, gave you a sense of individuality, and gave you status. So what do you have to do now? Now you have to learn how to regrow within the institution. You must rise within the institution by adopting and espousing the new values and norms. And that's why they do this. And this is a process they call institutionalization. This is why people who've been in prison or in the army uh, or sometimes in the hospital for very long periods of time can no longer function outside those institutions because they are so used to being taken care of. Now each institution is going to embody the broader culture of society but not in necessarily uh, the same way. You'll notice that each institution will tend to focus on certain types of values and norms that may seem contradictory in the terms of other institutions. So for example, think about greed. When you go to church, they tell you, don't be greedy. Greed is, is one of the seven deadly sins. But when you go to work, you're supposed to be greedy. You're supposed to sell stuff. You're supposed to make money at the expense of other people. Same thing with e equality. In politics, we're supposed to be equal. We're supposed to have one man, one vote. Everybody's supposed to have their point of view. But in workplace, again, we accept the notion of inequality as natural. So what happens when these things are conflicting? Well, the paradox is, we can live with those conflicts because the value systems are they're emphasizing different sides of each value system and somehow we can live with all of it right we can say you shouldn't be greedy uh, when we go to church but then say to somebody hold it you should be as greedy as you can because that's the nature of capitalism when we go to the workplace so thank you very much for uh, joining me, and I hope you had a good time. Before you do the quiz, make sure you check the companion for review and any further work. All right, bye.